minutes. Here we are. Last day in February. Um, so today I was going to do computing tools, but I'm not. Uh, you guys have a test coming up, so um, usually before the test I do a couple of uh, example problems for impedance matching. Uh, I can never remember if that's an A or an E. Impedance matching and um, and transmission lines. And these are just examples. Um, and they lead into me doing a little bit with Smith charts, which um, I don't believe Dr. Zahid covers in class. So that's what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to have a lot of drawing to do, so I'm going to get right into it. So this is the basic. Um, problem when you have, when you're looking at, at impedance matching. So you're usually, you're given some input and you have a matching network and then you have the load. So I'm going to call this the load. This is a matching network. So we, of course, want to, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, want to choose the matching network. So that maximum power is delivered to the load. And that means uh, two things, basically. Um, if I have this circuit driving um, the system, so here's my humongous matching network. And here, I'm just going to let um, the load be a resistance. Um, so. I'm going to call this R1, looking into the network from this side. I'm going to call this R2. So basically what we want in order to deliver maximum power to the load, we want R1 equal to the load resistance, and we want R2 equal to the source resistance. So basically this means that the power is going to be divided evenly between this resistor and this network, which is the best you can actually hope for uh, in the case where you have those parasitic things. And on the other side, um, it means that the power that gets into this network is split between the network here and the load. Um, so let's go ahead and just do an example really quick uh, of how we might do this using circuit analysis. So let me say that I have this thing here. Where are my numbers? Sorry, the circuit here. Oh, there it is. Sorry. All right, so here's my source, resistance, and the network that I'm going to try to use here is going to be an inductor and a capacitor, like this. Now, this is just kind of, it's not completely arbitrary because it's simple, um, but it's just a, an attempt at building the matching network, and here's my load. So for this case, RS is 50 ohms. My load is 200 ohms. And I would say my operating frequency is 1 gigahertz. And so I need to choose L and C, obviously, to basically match these conditions up here. But if I look at the uh, impedance from the perspective of the load. I'm going to call that Z2. I guess I'm going backwards from this one, but that's okay. You guys are quick. You can, you can roll with that one. Um, and this one I'm going to call Z1. So 
just writing down what these two are from, from the circuit. Um, Z1 is the capacitor uh, plus the parallel combination of the load and the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the inductor plus the parallel combination, combination of the capacitor and the, and the resistor. And if I write that down really quick, Omega C R L plus one. So that's just what that's going to be. Um, and then Z two, looking the other way, is going to be the capacitor in parallel with the series combination of the inductor and this resistance, which turns out to be. This is right. J omega RSL or J omega L plus RN. Um, so that's capacitor. Uh, yeah, I believe that's right. Okay. So how would I go about solving this thing? Uh, where did I write R in? Right here. Yeah, it's supposed to, sorry. It, in my notes, for some reason, I called it R in, but that's confusing with what I did up here, so I tried to change it to RS like this, and so I just missed that one. Sorry about that. Okay. So now, like I said before, I want Z2 equal to um, my load. So I want this one to look like the same uh, impedance as the load. And I want Z1 equal to RS. So if I just take this one and put RS here and do a, a little bit of manipulation, I'm going to have RS equals J omega L plus RL over J omega C. times RL plus 1. And a little bit further, I can go ahead and, and separate this out um, so if there's no fraction. I can say RS times 1 plus J omega C RL equals J omega L times 1 plus J omega C RL plus RL. So that's just multiplying by J omega C RL on both sides, or 1 plus J omega C RL. So now I'm just going to multiply that out, um, and it's not, this part is not very tricky. Uh, RS, RL, minus omega squared, L, C, RL, plus RL, plus J omega L. Okay, so that's about as far as I need to go with that particular thing right there. Um, so now I just I need to match the um, imaginary and um, real parts of this thing, and basically I need to find um, hold on one second. Um, so I just need to set the real imaginary parts equal to each other. So um, imaginary parts are omega C R S R L equals to omega L. So this gives me a way to choose L uh, or C, one or the other. Um, and then the real part is going to be omega squared L C R L equals RL minus RS. And so now I have this one. I can obviously cancel the omegas, and I can find a 
a solution for L, basically, and substitute it into this one. So I'm going to end up with omega squared C squared RS RL. And this is going to equal um, so it's, it's, one minus RS over RL. So I divided by RL. Um, that's why I don't have RL squared. Whoops, sorry. You guys can't even see. That's why I don't have RL squared right here. Um, but basically what I have now is a, um, a, a form that I can solve for the, the square of C. And so if I do that from this guy, I'm going to end up with C is equal to the square root of 1 minus Rn over Rl over, I'm going to use, oops, I'm sorry, this is Rs, Rs, um, omega squared Rs Rl. And now if I substitute in the actual numbers that I have from up here, um, 1 minus 50 over 200 over, omega is 2 pi times 10 to the ninth, seconds times 50 times 200 ohm squared. And I end up finding that the capacitance that I want is 1.378 times 10 to the minus 12 farads. And then I can back substitute that into this equation and find um, what C is, or what L is going to be. And if I do that, um, L is <clears throat> uh, 1.378 times 10 to the minus 8 Henry's. So I found a solution and it, it should work, assuming that I did everything correctly above. So this is an L match. And the Q for this one, um, I just looked this up uh, so that I didn't waste time, is basically going to be um, RL over RS minus 1, which in this case is 3, or square root of 3, which is fairly low. Usually you want a Q that's higher than that, um, and that basically means that the power that's going into the circuit is getting delivered to the load um, and not, uh, well, it means a couple of things. It means that the, pa the power that the circuit's storing Sorry, a higher Q means that the circuit is storing um, more energy and then more energy is getting delivered to the load. But it also means that the uh, width of the match is thinner, but it means that the peak is higher. So basically a higher, a higher Q means a, a better match at this frequency um, and it, it will act as a filter otherwise. Oh yeah, um, I was going to do another example where I do a different matching circuit, a pi match, but it relies on stuff from a different book and rather than um, trying to do that all to you here in class, I think I might just scan the notes on that one uh, so you guys can see it, but so that I don't spend a lot of time uh, trying to explain things in here. Um, it's a full example, um, it's, got, it's got everything that you need in there, um, it's just maybe not the best explanation, but basically um, I need to move on, but the, with the pi match I, I achieved a Q of about 50, which is a lot better. Um, and yeah, I will, I will go ahead and scan these notes. Um, but basically if you, you see here, the pi match looks like this, and you solve for Z in and Z out. Um, as labeled up there. And basically it revolves around doing this transformation where you've, you're splitting this inductor into these two inductors and then um, taking the load in this capacitor and combining them into something else. And that's the part that is not well explained. But essentially in the end you can calculate 
the values that you need for everything and end up with a queue that's pretty close to the one that I wanted to design for. So I'll put those right there and scan them in. All right, so now let's do a transmission line. So the example that I have here is I have a transmission line and it's connected to a load. Um, my characteristic impedance for my transmission line is 50 ohms and my load impedance here is 50 uh, plus J25 ohms. And I'm going to say that the length of my line is um, 3 lambda over 4. And this is lambda, the wavelength on the line. And um, basically the wavelength on the line is related to the wavelength in free space by um, 1 over the relative epsilon of the insulating material. I think that he's probably told you that in class. Um, so that's, that's the length of the line. And I want to find the input impedance here. So my input impedance is related to a bunch of different things. Basically, it's related to the characteristic impedance of the line. Obviously, it has to be related to the load. Um, and it's related to the tangent of um, beta times L. Um, and that basically accounts for propagation um, backwards on the line, back to this point um, in phase. Uh, obviously, for more information on that, you can check out one of the, the books, I believe. Um, is Rezavi the blue one? Yeah. So what's the other one? <laughs> the steer book, I believe, has this most of the stuff in it. Um, so if I, if I look at what I have here, um, beta times L is equal to, well, beta is 2 pi over lambda. And my length is 3 lambda over 4. So what I'm left with is, yeah, exactly, 3 pi over 2. And you're going you're gonna to be amazed. Um, tangent of x goes to infinity as x goes to 3 pi over 2. Ta-da. Um, clearly, I chose this for that very reason. Um, just makes a kind of interesting example. Um, but what happens to this equation is basically you're, you're just left with the imaginary part. So this goes to infinity, this goes to infinity, and so you're just left with my z in now being um, basically j z naught squared over j z in. And the j's cancel. And you're left with um, so for this particular case we have 50 squared over because that's the, the z naught 50 plus j 25. And that means that my input impedance, once I work this out, is 40 minus 20i. Or, I'm sorry, j. Um, let's stick with j. OK, so the reflection coefficient. Gamma. Uh, gamma equals uh, zl minus z0 over zl plus z0. So, I have on the top, I have J25 because 50 minus 50 is 0. And on the bottom, I have um, 100 ohms plus J25 ohms. This is ohms as well. Oops, that's a bad ohm sign. Um, and when I work this out, I get 1 17th plus 4J over 17, which is maybe not very helpful because it doesn't actually tell you that much uh, in this in polar form, but you can. Uh, I'm sorry, rectangular form, but you can convert it to polar form pretty easily. 
and that kind of tells you a little bit more. Uh, it's 0.243 times e to the j 1.326. And this angle is in radians. Um, if it's not, you need to put a degree sign up there, otherwise people won't know what you're talking about. Um, but basically, um, if you remember, gamma is the ratio of um, the reflected voltage over the incident voltage. And so this means at about one quarter of the incident energy is, is reflected. And if you work it out to power, that's a, it's about 8% eight, eight ish. Um, and a phase angle of 1.326 rads. Okay, so that's doing stuff by hand. So now to the fun part. <laughs> Let's do stuff by using the Smith chart. Okay, so that I'm going to do the transmission line example first because it, it involves less explanation. I'm going to give you a Smith chart in case you want one. Sure. sure. Okay. Here's my Smith chart. So it's probably a little bit difficult to see, but I'll scan the notes so you guys can, can see everything. But basically, it says right here, this is... Um, Everything in here it says resistance component R over Z naught. Um, capacitive reactance uh, uh, minus JX over Z naught. Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't see the slash. <laughs> and this is inductive reactance uh, plus JX over Z naught. So basically, um, everything has to be normalized uh, by Z naught. But once I do that, I can go ahead and and plot things on here really easily. So. If I take my example from before, my ZL was 50 ohms plus J25 ohms. So ZL normalized is now going, um, my characteristic impedance was 50 ohms. Um, if I look right here, 50 ohms. So that's the number that I'm going to normalize by. So ZL normalized is now 1 plus j over 2. Okay, so the first thing that I have to do is actually plot that on this crazy diagram. Um, so the real part is found along this line right here, and the imaginary part uh, are on these curves. So going up is positive imaginary, going down is negative imaginary. Um, so real part 1 is right here. And so I need to follow the curve that goes right through that point up to J over 2, which is right here. Okay. So what can I do now? Many, many things. First of all, just by plotting that point, I can now find the reflection coefficient and the standing wave ratio, uh, which I actually forgot to do. I'm sorry. Standing wave, let me, let me go, just write that down really quick. Um, Standing wave ratio, or S, uh, 1 plus magnitude of gamma over 1 minus magnitude of gamma. And for this case, uh, it's 1.642. Okay. So that's the number that I'm, I'm expecting to find approximately using the Smith chart. The Smith chart is fast but less accurate, um, which is fine in most cases. But the way that I need to find these values is by measuring the distance from the origin to the point. Now, I forgot all of my stuff today. But fortunately, you don't actually need anything but a piece of paper to do this. Um, so if I want to find the distance between these two points, I'm going to just take my piece of paper and mark here whoops, and here. Uh, you probably can't see that very well on the camera, but it, it works. Um, so the reflection coefficient magnitude is right here, and it's measured on this third line down, and you measure uh, out from the center. 
So if I look at the value that I have here, I have approximately, um, it looks like about 0.25. And that's expected, uh, it's about what I got for the other one uh, of 0.243, but you have to allow for some inaccuracy based on the, the, you know, the, the visual measurement here. Um, if I do the same thing for the standing wave ratio, it's the top, top scale, and you measure again out from the center to the left. And this one's harder to do because it's a, a logarithmic scale. But to me, I'm going to say S looks like 1.65. Um, and that's, again, you know, you have to kind of guess because you're measuring, measuring things. So the, the thing that I don't have for gamma is the angle. Well, fortunately, that's on the chart, too. Um, you can't see probably very well, but on this on these outer rings, there are markings. Um, the inner one says angle of transmission coefficient in degrees. The next one out says angle of reflection coefficient in degrees. So the way that I find the angle for my reflection coefficient is I take this line that joins the center, uh, the, the origin, and my point, and I just extend it out oops, to that line over there. and. You can't see that very well, and that maybe didn't make it any better. But if I look right here, it's, um, pardon? Oh, part, pull it down. Sorry, so I'm looking, um, this is 70 right here, and this is 80, and those are in degrees. So it looks to be about 76 degrees. Um, and if I, oh, I forgot my calculator. If I convert uh, 1.326, uh, radians to degrees, I believe it's about 70, 76 ish degrees. So that matches up perfectly. So the other thing that I did with the, the transmission line example was I found the input impedance after a three uh, quarter wavelength line. So going back to the Smith chart, the other two circles, the outer two circles, are marked over here. So the third circle out says wavelengths uh, towards the load. We're already at the load, so we actually need to go back towards the generator, quote unquote. And that's the outer circle, and it says wavelengths towards the generator, and it's going uh, clockwise here. So if you look at the markings here, it only goes up to half a wavelength, and that's because it basically repeats after uh, half a wavelength. So um, what I need to do is find where I'm at out here and I'm about at, I always call this lambda equals 0.145 because um, that's the approximate lambda measurement that I'm at. So if I want to go out to, um, to 3 quarters wavelength, I need to just go ahead and take this circle around 3 quarters of a wavelength. So I know that one full revolution is half a wavelength. So I only need to actually go a quarter of a wavelength, which is um, half a, a circle, which it just works out that way for this uh, particular example. So if I go ahead and do that, actually, I need my marks. Where are my marks? They're my marks. Um, normally, you do this with a compass and a straight edge, and that, that works a little bit easier. Um, the reason why a compass is nice is because you can just draw a circle and then um, draw a line that intersects it. So for my case, um, I'll just draw this line out here. And then, again, you probably can't see it, but my, one of my markings is, is lined up right at the origin. The other one is right here. And so if I just put that onto that line that I just drew, it's about right there. So that's the point that I'm looking at. And if I try and, and take that into, uh, let me mark what this is, 3 pi over 4 line. So that's my Zn after a 3 pi over 4 line. And that equals approximately, it's pretty close to, it's, it's near 0.8, but it's also, I can't really tell. This is the whole thing. Um, 
about transmission lines. We'll call it point eight. Um, and then the imaginary part is uh, point four, or I'm sorry, minus point four. So if you look right here, I've, it's, it's on this line basically, and this line is down, so it's minus imaginary. And uh, it's marked right here and right here. So minus J.4, and that's the normalized value. Um, let me write that right here, normalized. So Z in denormalized is basically this value times 50. Well, 0.8 times 50 is 40, and 0.4 times 50 is 20. And where is that? Didn't I write that down? Did I never write that down? Okay. Well, I did? Where did I write it? I can't find it on my piece of paper now. Oh, it's underneath there. Of course. Here it is. So my answer is... 40 minus J20, and 40 minus J20. So I was able to find the reflection coefficient, um, the standing wave ratio, and the input impedance all using this pitch chart, and do it pretty accurately. And if I hadn't been talking while I was doing it, I probably would have done it probably about three times as fast. Um, just because I, all I had to do was draw and do really simple arithmetic. So that's, that's uh, transmission lines on a Smith chart. So let's see if we can get through matching on a Smith chart, which is kind of a whole other beast. Well, it's not a whole other beast because it's pretty similar, but there are several things that I want to tell you first. Okay, and those things are this. Um, where are you? Here we go. So all of this stuff is sort of marked on the, on the Smith chart. Basically, this direction is increasing resistance. Okay. Um, this is marked on these are these ones are marked on here. This is increasing inductive reactance. And this is increasing capacitive reactants. Okay, and to kind of connect with um, what I was doing with the reflection coefficient stuff, um, if I draw a line up the middle of this thing, This axis basically um, is the imaginary component of gamma, and on the um, on the, this line down here, this is the uh, real part of gamma. Now you don't see rectangular coordinates for this because you don't need them because you can just use the angles out here instead of, um, you know, putting another ax another uh, set of axes on this thing and making it really confusing. They've just given you that um, that uh, way to do that. So other things that I used in that previous example. This is the angle of gamma. Magnitude of gamma is measured down here. Um, scale for the magnitude of gamma. And then, of course, um, those other things that are marked out here. I'm going to leave this the way it is for now. And I'm going to go and scribble on another one. Okay. So. We know all that stuff now about the Smith chart. No, so what does it mean to add components to a, to a circuit and how does it change the Smith chart? That's kind of the thing that um, really 
helps you build matching circuits. So if, if I say start out at a point here, and I want to move this direction, that is the direction that I would move if I were adding a series resistor. Okay. This direction is the direction that I would move if I were adding a series inductor. And this direction is the direction I move if I were adding a series capacitor. Capacitor. To find out the uh, how I move if I were to add shunt components, you actually have to reflect this thing through the origin and then um, kind of do the same thing. So the this scale down here um, says capacitive reactance or inductive susceptance. So if I reflect through the origin and then start moving along one of these lines down, that's uh, inductive susceptance, so that's a, adding a shunt uh, inductor. What it does, though, to these things up here is this. So if I, if I start at the same point and I, I try to draw the same kind of lines, this direction is a shunt resistance. Okay. This direction, where that is supposed to be a, a curve about this origin again, but it just doesn't quite look like it. Well, actually, no, it's not. Um, it's supposed to be a curve about an origin over here that matches this radius. Um, this is a shunt capacitor. And if I go the other direction, this is a shunt inductor. So I scribble these on here so that I know which direction I kind of, what I need to add in order to move a specific direction on a Smith chart. Mm -hmm. it, so what happens is, if I reflect this point through the origin, I'd end up, I think, right here. And then a, I would turn into a, a, an admittance Smith chart, and then I would start moving this way. Okay, And then I would have to reflect that back through the origin to get the uh, impedance Smith chart again. And if I did that, I'd end up over here. So basically, it means that the, the shunt reactance, or shunt resistor moves you this direction. I had to think really long and hard to, to, find, to figure that out, to be honest. Um, it took me a little while to kind of put those things together, so I, ho I hope that part is helpful for you. Um, so let's go ahead and do an example here so that we can see what it's like to do this. Hopefully we can get through this in 10 minutes. Um, I don't know if we can. So I'm going to look at, I have this load. So I have a 1.6 picofarad capacitor and a 100 ohm resistor. And my frequency is going to be 1 gigahertz because it's easy. And I want to match um, to a 50 ohm driver of some sort. So what it means. A good match basically has a reflection coefficient of zero. So if I have a reflection coefficient of zero, it means my magnitude is zero, and it means that the point is sitting basically here at the center. So the first thing to do is to find out what the, um, the normalized uh, impedance of this system is going to be. So that's not hard to do. So it's 100 ohms plus the... Um, reactance of the capacitor, uh, which, not, not plus J, 1 over J, sorry, 1 over J, uh, 2 pi times 10 to the ninth hertz times the capacitance, 1.6 picofarads. Okay, when I calculate this out, 
this comes out to be 100 ohms minus J99.5 ohms. Okay, so now to put it on the Smith chart, I have to normalize it. In this case, since I'm matching to a 50 ohm load, I normalize it by 50 ohms. So my normalized input impedance is 2 minus J uh, 1.99. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do is put this number on the Smith chart. So it's 2 minus J 1.99. So I find 2 on the real line. That's this curve right here. And then uh, 1.99 is down here. Uh, right next to 2, right? So that's the point right there. So that's where I'm starting at, and I want to get back to the origin here. So, sorry, 9, 10. If I don't number these, they will never get back in order. And so the first thing that I can do is um, if I put a series inductor, I can get back up to the real line. Is that good or bad? I don't know. So let's put a series inductor. And it's normalized inductance, um, Jx equals J omega Ln equals J 1.99. So that's the normalized inductance that I want to find. Um, if I calculate this out, uh, the inductance, again normalized, is 3.183 as 10 to the minus 10, I think, yeah. And the units that I'm going to put on this are Henry's per ohm, okay? Because it's normalized by the 50 ohms. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Minus 10. Sorry. Um, Henry's per ohm. So my actual inductance that I want is ln times 50. And so that comes out to 15.92 nano Henry's. Okay. So now my normalized load impedance is 2, just 2. Um, if I were to leave it here, my gamma would be 0.34 with an angle of 0. And not, not so great. And my standing wave ratio would be about 2.04. Okay. So from this point, I know that moving along this axis this way is going to be a shunt resistor. Okay. So I could add a shunt resistor and get back to the origin, voila. But resistors are bad in matching circuits because they basically waste power. So what I'm going to do is basically try to get to this curve somehow so that I can just go basically to the origin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reflect through the origin to get an admittance Smith chart. to this point right here. And flip this thing over. So now, if I'm going to add a shunt capacitor in an admittance Smith chart, it's going to go this direction. Okay. So I'm going to go to this point right here. And why would I do that? because I know that this point is the dual of this point over here. And if I can get to that point, I'm, I'm set, basically. Um, so that's my shunt capacitor. And its value um, this is going to be page 11. Sorry, I'm way off the top there. Shunt capacitor. Thank you. So uh, JB equals J omega CN. 
that's my normalized capacitance. B is my uh, admittance at this point, and my admittance, the change in admittance that I'm doing here is um, uh, J one half. So J over two equals J uh, two pi times 10 to the ninth hertz times my normalized capacitance, okay? And so my normalized capacitance I find is um, seven point nine five times ten to the minus eleventh farads. And now that's farad ohms. So my unnormalized capacitance is CN over fifty or in this case, uh, 1.592 picofarads. Okay, that's about six picofarads, or 1.6 picofarads. So, what would I do at this point? <clears throat> I would reflect back to the origin, find myself here, and add a, another series inductor and get myself right back to the origin. Now the change in um, impedance here is half the change in impedance uh, for this inductor so that I know that the inductance of this, um, this final inductor is half the impedance or um, half the inductance of the other one. So it's going to be 7.95, oops, nanohenries. Okay, so that's my matching circuit. So what's it going to look like? Here's my load. 100 ohms, 1.6 picofarads. And your matching circuit you build out from the load in the same order that you added cir uh, circuit elements. So this is my first series inductor, my shunt capacitor, and my last series inductor. So this is my 1.592 picofarad capacitor, 15.92 um, nanohenry, and 7.958 nanohenries. So the last step that you would do if you had time, which I, I don't have time to actually do it, but I can tell you what, what the match ends up being. Um, The Z in here, as expected, is 50 ohms. Okay, and that's just taking all these components uh, together and finding what their apparent uh, impedance is going to be. So uh, that's, I hope, helpful. Um, if you have questions about Smith charts or matching circuits, um, please feel free to email me. I guess most of you can't. Uh, make it to my office hours, or don't want to. Um, but I'm I'm pretty decent with Smith charts, and I'm, I'm okay with matching circuits. So if you have questions about them, please send them to me. Um, and I guess that's all that we have for today. So have a good weekend. <laughs>